Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz. I'm from Middletown Township Public Library, and we are so grateful to have Dr. Matthew Raybard here, and he is going to lead us in a discussion about his book, Lead Like a Pro. So um, take it away. Thank you, and welcome, and look forward to hearing. I'm going to mute myself right now. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you to you and the library for having me. I really appreciate it and excited to be here talking about leadership for athletic coaches. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I have spent my entire professional career in college athletics. Uh, first, I was a men's college basketball coach, and now I'm in athletics administration. Um, but really, the book, the genesis for the book kind of came from my experiences as a coach and looking for more leadership resources that were specifically geared towards me. Um, so from that, going through my coaching career and eventually going back to school to pursue a doctorate in education and leadership, it was just really natural for me to want to do research into athletic coach leadership styles. If for nothing more than I just wanted to know what the research said about the different leadership styles that were best for me to practice, different leadership behaviors, kind of the do's and don'ts of leadership. And then it kind of morphed into writing a book based on that research about how I could help coaches just become better, more effective leaders for their athletes and teams. So the really kind of the, the central theme of the book and everything that I talk about, the work I do now with coaches at different levels of sports is the idea that coaches are leaders. And, you know, when I, when I talk to groups about this, I inevitably get some eye rolls. Sometimes I get a little pushback, a question or two uh, that, you know, am I really a leader? You know, usually the college coaches, high school coaches, you know, if it's your full-time job to be a coach or it's a, it's a significant part of your identity to be a coach, then you absorb the coaches or leaders, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for a lot of coaches who are part-time or volunteer or they're coaching their son and daughter's team, it's youth sports, it's rec league, I get that pushback where they say, yeah, I'm kind of a leader, but not really. I'm more of just a coach. So coach and leader are inextricably linked throughout this entire presentation. There is no separating coach and leader. If you are a coach, you are a leader. It doesn't matter whether you are volunteering to coach your son or daughter's youth sports team for an hour or two a week, you are still leading them. And the leadership behaviors, the leadership style that you practice is going to have an effect on them, either positive or negative. And, you know, I, I don't say that to, to scare coaches or scare parents or scare prospective coaches. I say that so that we understand that as coaches, Kind of the, the second theme that I talk about is that the decisions we make matter. The decisions we make are leadership decisions because we are leaders, and they're going to have a positive or a negative impact on our kids. There's no decision that you make that's perfectly neutral, that has kind of a, a zero impact on your kids. Some kids, it may roll off their shoulders, but for others, it may have a negative impact. For others, it may have a positive impact, and that's okay. Not every decision leaders make is going to have a positive impact. It's not even necessarily going to have the intended outcome that you thought it would when you made it. But the point is that you're making that decision through a leadership lens, and it's reflective of who you are as a leader. And by who you are as a leader, I'm talking about what your personal values and beliefs are as a leader. You know, Knowing those, making decisions based on it is how leaders continue to grow and develop. And we'll talk more about that as we kind of go through the presentation. But Right off the top, coaches are leaders, and the decisions you make for your kids and for your teams are leadership decisions. So that's why I believe that all coaches at all levels of sports, no matter how long you've been doing it, no matter how much a part of your identity it is, all coaches need leadership education and training. You know, that was why that was what I was always looking for as a college basketball coach. I wanted more resources and training and knowledge about how I could be a better and more effective leader. So I read books. I read books by business leaders. I read books for teachers in education and higher education. And I learned a lot. But I found kind of this area in the research that was just, it was lacking. There wasn't a lot of specific research on what was the best leadership styles for athletic coaches. There were great coaches who were very successful that wrote books about what worked for them. And that's important. There's a lot that can be learned from that, but what works for Bill Belichick or 
John Wooden isn't necessarily going to work for me because I am not them, right? And one of the leadership mistakes that I made as a young coach that a lot of leaders make, particularly new leaders, younger leaders, is they think that by replicating the leadership style and behaviors of successful coaches, that they will be successful. I thought that. I thought I'm going to study the great coaches. I'm going to emulate what they do, and I'm going to be a great coach too. But the point was not that they were a transformational leader or they were a servant leader. That wasn't inherently what made them successful. What made them successful was that they understood what their personal values and beliefs are. They understood what the best or right leadership style and behaviors was for them to be able to pass those things on to their teams, to be able to motivate, inspire, um, you know, persevere, overcome. All of those things were built into their leadership style over time through trial and error by figuring things out. Right. And that's why as coaches, getting that education, getting that training, having that uh, having that foundational base of knowledge, starting to construct a tool belt for ourselves with our leadership tools is how you then get on that path to becoming a more successful leader. So you know, the influence that coaches have is it's very important and it's very powerful. And again, I don't, I'm not trying to scare coaches and say that if you're coaching your, your six-year-old soccer team, that, you know, if you make the right leadership, if you make the wrong leadership choice that you're going to irreparably scar them in soccer for their entire lives. Okay. That's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. It's okay. But the decisions that you make, like how you correct them, you know, what you emphasize how you inspire and motivate them, even how you just talk to them on their level can help them create a really positive memory and experience from that team and then want to continue, right? I tell coaches all the time, keep everything very simple, especially for kids that are little, right? Small successes are really big to them. So by focusing on, okay, let's pass from, from you know, I'm gonna pass over there to my friend who's a few feet away, them being able to do that after two practices, that could be a huge success that catapults them to want to stay in soccer for the, the next season. So, you know, as coaches, we have that level of influence, right? And that goes all the way up to when I was at the college level. You know, the number one thing that I always talked about every season with my teams and my student athletes that was important to me was their experience. If they weren't having a good experience, we weren't going to be a good team. And if you try to put be a good team before good experience, before building positive relationships between having trust and mutual respect, it's never going to work, right? So it's about understanding those things as a coach and a leader, figuring out what is your leadership style, what's going to work for you. And then again, through your decisions that you make, always reflecting your personal and values and beliefs so that you give yourself the best opportunity to present yourself and have a positive impact. It's not always gonna happen, but it gives you the best opportunity and the best intentions to be able to do it. So, you know, one kind of glaring thing that came up in my research is what I call the leadership gap. And what I realized when I set out to find, well, what are the leadership style or styles that are best for coaches to practice? Well, I'm gonna give you a spoiler from the book. There is no leadership style that is best for athletic coaches to practice. Some are better than others, and we'll talk through a little bit of those, and I talk a lot about it in the book, but there is not one leadership style to where I can tell you, if you practice this leadership style, you have the best chance to be a successful coach. There are some that are better than others, and I'll recommend those to you. We'll kind of talk through them, but there's no guarantee with any leadership style. There are a lot of great coaches that are transformation leaders. There's a lot of bad coaches that are transformational leaders, right? It's about how you practice transformational leadership. It's not about, well, Phil Jackson was a servant leader. I'm going to be a servant leader. All servant leaders are going to be successful because they put the needs of others first. They do, and that's amazing, and that's a great leadership behavior that I recommend for coaches, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful, okay? particularly if it's not something that actually speaks to you. So what happened with this leadership gap was when I was conducting the research and getting feedback from coaches and I saw, oh, you know, a lot of coaches are transformational leaders and they're successful. And oh, and a lot of coaches are servant leaders and they're successful. And a lot of coaches are democratic leaders and they're successful. And I thought, okay, well, what's the differentiating factor if it's not leadership style between successful coaches and non-successful coaches? 
And it wasn't actually style. It wasn't transformational leaders were X amount more successful than servant leaders. It wasn't about the leadership style. It was about two things. First, it was about leadership knowledge. The coaches who were more successful had a much deeper and greater understanding of foundational leadership styles, meaning the coaches who were more successful had a better understanding of what it meant to be a transformational leader, what it meant to be a servant leader, what it meant to be a democratic leader. The coaches who were not as successful didn't have that same knowledge base and understanding of what those leadership styles were. And more importantly, what were the key behaviors of those leadership styles? So that was the first kind of leadership gap that I set out in the book to fill for coaches by providing them with more foundational leadership knowledge. And we'll go through in the next part of this, some of those different leadership styles so you can fill in that gap for yourself as well. The other kind of main gap that I found between successful leaders and leaders who weren't as successful was having the, the right tools or enough tools in their leadership toolbox to be able to practice the best leadership style and behaviors for them. So I'll give you an example because this happened to me when I was a young coach. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know I was falling victim to the leadership gap that I would identify 15 years later. But, you know, when I was, when I got my first college coaching job, it is at a small division two school called Western New Mexico down in the Southwest corner of New Mexico. I'm sure you've all heard of it. I'm sure you've all rooted for us. And so I, thank you. And I went down there and I, like I told you, I was going to be the next great coach. But in order for me to be a coach, I had to be enrolled in a grad program. It was part of my compensation was they told me I had to go to school more. Um, and that was going to be my payment for working all the time. It was in retrospect, it was a phenomenal deal for me because of how things worked out. But at the time, I probably should have been a little more skeptical. But anyway, they they only had two leader, they only had two program, uh, two master's programs that I could realistically get into and complete because I was a history and classical studies major in college. So nothing very applicable to what I would ever do in my entire life. So, you know, I met with my advisor and she told me, Matt, it's counseling or it's educational leadership. And I said, okay, I don't really care. And so we put the program side by side and they really, they really looked the same to me. I really thought, I, I really don't care. Like somebody just pick one. They, they, they both could be very applicable to what I'm doing. Counseling makes sense. Leadership makes sense. And then we got to the end, which was timeline to graduation and counsel and uh, educational leadership was two falls, two springs, you're done. I said, okay, I can get behind that. I said, what's counseling? Well, counseling was two falls and two springs as well, except in the middle was a summer internship. So based on that, I chose educational leadership. Really good decision in retrospect. So I start taking the classes for educational leadership and I start really enjoying them. And the first thing I just gravitate towards are these different leadership styles, particularly transformational leadership. I'm learning about the key behaviors. We're discussing it in class. And I'm like inspiration and motivation, um, you know, relationships based on mutual trust and respect, clear, positive and direct communication. I had the aha moment. These things are me. I'm a transformational leader. So if I wasn't going to be the next great coach before by copying other great coaches, I had the aha moment that I was a transformational leader. I know who I am. I am now going to be the next great coach. So I went out to practice and I started being a transformational leader or what I thought it was, which to me was using my, my voice, my words, my communication to be as inspirational, positive and uplifting as possible. And it worked pretty well. You know, who would have thought that, you know, your athletes would like being praised and that would motivate them. That worked pretty well for some of my athletes. They were making strides. They were accomplishing short-term goals. They were making progress towards long-term goals. I felt great. Problem solved. I'm going to be a great coach. And then I looked around and about the other half of the team, they weren't really doing that much with my communication weren't really feeling it. All my enthusiasm, all my inspiration, it was just kind of just going right past them. And now I felt like a failure because I was like, well, how come for one group, they're motivated by what I'm saying and the other group, it's just not resonating. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out what this was. Like, what was the issue, right? Like, I understand people are different. They're motivated differently. But I'm like, I'm pretty inspirational. Like, my transformational leadership, I thought was pretty strong as a coach. It felt pretty natural. 
But what I came to realize later on was there's more than one leadership tool in order to be able to practice a leadership behavior. Not everybody is inspired by communication, no, no matter how motivating and inspiring it is. Some people are motivated by behavior modeling. So another great tool in your leadership toolbox, if you're a transformation leader, is to model behaviors, not talk about them, model behaviors of resiliency, overcoming adversity, hard work, determination. And once I realized that, I was able to then meet the needs of more of my athletes and motivate and inspire them. Still not all, but more. And that's that's that second part of the leadership gap, which is not having enough leadership tools in your toolbox to effectively meet the, the different needs of all of your athletes, to be able to get to that same outcome of them being motivated and inspired. So how do you determine the right leadership style for you? When I set out to write the book, I thought a lot about how I would write this. What? How did I want to present it? And I had a lot of really complicated formulas and a whole chapter on this is how you determine the right leadership style for you. And I'm reading through it and I'm reading through it. And I'm like, I'm writing it and I don't even understand it. So I broke it down to three very simple steps, but they are how I teach determining a leadership style. They are how I review and think about my leadership style. Because it's not always about having a complicated formula to get to a simple answer, right? So number one is reflect on and determine what are your personal values and beliefs as a leader, okay? You have to know who you are in order to know what the right leadership style is for you, okay? You have to know what's important to you. You have to know what makes sense for you. Two is you have to learn foundational leadership knowledge. So I know that it's really important to me to be positive, uplifting, inspirational, build relationships, clear, direct communication. Those are great things for me to know about myself, but I need to know what leadership styles those reflect. That's how I build my leadership practice. And then third is you have to acquire the tools necessary to practice that leadership style and, and be effective in those behaviors. That's the hardest part, you know, because those come from everywhere. They come from experiences, they come from mentors, they come from books, they come from presentations, but they take a long time to acquire and there's a lot of trial and error. So I always I always say, accumulate as many tools as you possibly can in your toolbox. And then if it doesn't work, just throw it away. But if you could acquire it, acquire it because you could never have too many. So in the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna talk through some leadership styles and tools that are really great to practice them. But, you know, a couple of things at the onset, because I never want anybody as we go through the process of figuring out what your leadership style is to feel like they're doing it wrong. There is no wrong way to determine what your leadership style is. But remember, every coach, every person has a different set of values, beliefs, personality, communication style. So even if I'm a transformational leader and you're a transformational leader, it's still going to look and feel different. So never judge your leadership style against other people to determine whether or not you're doing it right or correctly. Because ultimately, us practicing the same behavior could look very, very different and have two very, very different effects. No leader only practices one leadership style, okay? Some leadership styles like uh, transformation leadership and servant leadership are really great for inspiring and motivating and building relationships. Other leadership styles like democratic leadership and autocratic leadership are really great for decision-making. It's really all about figuring out what the combination of different leadership styles and their key behaviors is that builds your unique leadership style and your leadership practice. And then the last kind of part that I'll kind of mention everybody is, you know, your leadership style is not static. It's going to always be constantly changing, evolving, and growing as you're changing as a leader, as the needs of your athletes and your team are changing. So always remember that your leadership style one year for one team might be different the next year, and that's okay. But it's important to always recognize that and be able to build off of it. So what this all kind of adds up to is helping coaches make intentional leadership choices. So, you know, that starts with asking yourself these and other important questions. You know, what's important to me as leader? What are my responsibilities as a leader? What, what are my goals for the team? You know, for me, my goal was I always wanted my team to have a great experience. Okay, 
That's the outcome that I want of my leadership decisions. How do I get there? I get there by making intentional leadership choices that I think will help give my athletes, give my team the best opportunity to have a great experience. So, for example, for me, and we'll kind of come back to this at the end when we kind of assess our leadership practice, but kind of for me, and, and this is a, an actual example that happened in my coaching career, was I set out at the start of the season one year, and I said, I'm going to make three specific intentional leadership choices as a transformational leader to help my athletes and team have a great experience. So intentional leadership choice number one was that I was going to show up to practice early before everybody else got there. And I was going to greet my athletes one-on-one -on -one as they came to practice. I was going to, you know, give them a high five, say hello, ask them how they were doing. I was going to give them what's called individual consideration, some special attention to help build that really strong relationship based on trust and respect. That was the first intentional leadership choice I made. The second intentional leadership choice I made was that I had been realizing for several years that basically every season, my athletes liked receiving feedback from me in front of their peers less and less. They did not want criticism or critiques in front of their teammates, a majority. So I wanted to adjust to this. I felt like I was hurting my relationships with a number of my athletes. So I decided that at practice, as much as possible, I was going to ask athletes to come to the side and give them feedback one-on-one. -on -one. Some individual consideration, trying to meet the needs of what I thought they were looking for for me, which was that kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback, not putting them in a position to where they had to receive it in front of their peers, I'm going to make that intentional leadership choice. I'm going to make that adjustment instead of before I would just kind of coach on the fly, what a lot of coaches do, a coach when, as things are happening. Okay. And then the last leadership choice I made, and, and I did this for college students, was I wanted them to remember that even though there's a lot of pressure, even though we want to win, and even though their coaches are under a lot of pressure, and there's a lot going on. Ultimately, basketball is a game and it should be fun. So I wanted to end every practice with a game. So those are the intentional leadership choices I made that I hoped over the course of the season would help my athletes have a great experience and, and hopefully have fun. We're gonna go through some different leadership styles now. And then at the end, when we learn how to assess our leadership practice, I'll talk you through how some of those intentional leadership choices worked for me. So leadership styles, I've mentioned a bunch of leadership styles. And again, no leadership style is gonna guarantee that you're gonna be an effective leader, but there are some leadership styles, some key behaviors that I want to point out, as well as some great tools for practicing them. And as we're going, hopefully you'll start to see your personal values and beliefs reflected in the different leadership styles, and you'll be able to build or form your unique leadership practice. So transformational leadership. As a coach, I was a transformational leader. I had influences from other leadership styles, but at the foundation of my leadership practice was strong transformational leadership. And that was rooted in inspiration and motivation. I believe that as a coach, it is my job to help my athletes believe they can be more and achieve more than they thought they could on their own. How do I do that? Well, I can do that through my communication. That's a great leadership tool. I can do that through behavior modeling. That's another great tool. Put those both in your toolbox and you are going to meet the needs of a lot of your athletes as a transformation leader, but probably not all of them. Okay. So what are some other tools to have in your toolbox? You know, one is using inspir you, me, working to inspire confidence in your athletes. Sometimes what keeps your athletes or your kids from responding to your behavior modeling or your communication is they don't have the confidence to do it. So taking a step back, looking for some of those signs that maybe they're having, they're lacking that confidence in trying and working to inspire that in them is a very powerful transformational leadership tool. You can do this through your hard work, you could do this through your communication, but it's about inspiring that confidence in them first before kind of inspiring and motivating them to go out and try, you know? Another great leadership tool to have in your toolbox transformation leader is building a sense of purpose in your athletes. Don't take for granted, particularly at a young age, but I found this all the way up to the college level as well. Don't take for granted that everybody on the team understands the true value of their membership on the team and how much of an impact, a positive impact they can have based on their unique skill set, what they bring to the table. You know, 
what I always, and you know, some coaches or leaders will call it defining roles. You know, some will call it, you know, kind of playing up each person's strengths. Well, however you want to view it, make sure everybody has that sense of purpose. You know, we worked on a lot of this with my athletes at the college level. Everybody wants to score points in basketball. It, that's great, right? Not everybody can, but we can't score, score points if we don't make good passes. If we don't set good screens to get our teammates open, we're not going to outscore people and win games. So if we don't play defense, if we don't hustle, if we don't from the sideline, you know, vocalize to our teammates on the court, where to be, what's happening, help them out. If we don't, when they come off the court, have them pick up their heads, give them a high five. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a purpose. Even if you don't play very much on the team, you could still work very hard in practice to push your teammates to be better, right? You could still learn all the plays so you could help them be in the right spot. Everybody ha needs that sense of purpose. And as a coach and a transformational leader, it's a big part of your responsibility to make sure that everybody understands their purpose and the value in it. That also is going to have a really, really strong positive impact on your team culture. Because if everybody feels value, if everybody feels that sense of purpose, they're more likely to have buy-in and you have a, a much stronger knit team community. Transformational leaders have a lot of use a lot of clear, positive, and direct communication. You know, sometimes that can be confused with transformational leaders only say things that are positive. That's not true. But as I kind of touched on before, they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication. A lot of, you know, look each other in the eye, a lot of speaking to the individual. That's how transformational leaders build strong relationships based on mutual trust and respect. So if you really want to build relationship with your athlete, use a lot of that clear, direct, positive communication. You could, you know, positive does not mean, does not always mean um, that you're not giving criticism or not giving corrections. You're just doing it in a way that is positive and uplifting. You know, I always used to tell my athletes, okay, you know, you're struggling with your left hand, but we're going to work on it and figure it out. Let's do these drills together. I always tried to insert myself into the criticism or the critique because it landed softer. It had a more of a positive note to it, even though I was telling you we need to work on this and fix it. You know, show strong support for your athletes. Take an optimistic approach to their improvement. You know, what I say to coaches who are transformation leaders is, Sometimes you have done all the coaching, you have given all the instruction, it's time to step back and just be a cheerleader because they can do it. They just need to see you over there rooting for them, not telling them what to do, not instructing them, not micromanaging, just on the sideline rooting for them. Sometimes that can make a huge difference. So don't forget that tool that sometimes as a coach, a tool in your leadership toolbox is to step back from coaching. The next leadership style I'll talk about is another great leadership style for coaches to practice. It's servant leadership. At the foundation of servant leadership is putting the needs of everybody else and the team above your own. And I, I really believe that everybody who makes the decision to be a coach is at least in some small way practicing servant leadership. Because inherent in coaching is you showing up for the learning, growth, and development of others. You're there to help others improve first. And to me, that's reflective of servant leadership. Servant leaders primarily use tools of behavior modeling. And what they, they focus on is modeling great behaviors like empathy, teamwork, inclusion, listening, unselfishness. What you're doing as a servant leader is you're setting a standard and expectation for how you believe your team should act. You know, you're demonstrating to them, this is how you are empathetic. This is how you are inclusive. So from there, now you have the credibility to say you are not being empathetic. You are not being inclusive. You are not being unselfish. And you will have modeled for them. You will have set the template for how to do it. So it takes away a lot of those excuses. It takes a lot of the I out of it, a lot of the what the individual wants. And it puts that focus more on the team, the team culture, and that kind of um, idea of what you're trying to create within that team construct. Servant leaders also really work hard to develop and enhance leadership abilities of all team members. I'm, I'm really going to pin down this one for a minute because I think this one is so important. And it's actually one of the great leadership regrets of my coaching career that I did not understand the power of this until later on. As coaches, we're leaders, right? I, I've been to keep repeating that throughout the presentation, but 
sometimes inherent in coaching is us doing what I like to call fill the leadership vacuum. So coaches have a tendency, and I did this myself, so I'm not casting aspersions on anybody else. I'm the number one culprit of this. But coaches have a tendency to always be coaching. So ABC, I just came up with that. Okay, but um, to always be coaching. So what that means is when coaches see something great happen, we immediately want to praise it. When we see a mistake happen, we immediately want to correct it. And while that's a very natural coaching instinct, what it doesn't do is leave room for your athletes to enter into that space and provide positive feedback for each other or positively correct each other in a way that you have previously demonstrated. So if you're always filling that leadership vacuum and you're not letting your athletes in, it's going to slow their leadership development. So what I really suggest for coaches, and I hope everybody will go out and just try this at your next practice, no matter what the age is. I, I've done this with four, five, six-year-olds. Just it's it's amazing what they will do and some of the leadership um, characteristics and abilities that will start to show themselves at that age, just because you gave them an opportunity and a safe space to do it. So the next time you're at practice, be really intentional. If you see something great happen, don't say anything. Leave it alone. See what your athletes do. See if they step into that space and provide some praise for each other. If they don't, that's perfectly okay. But instead of then stepping into it, try prompting them. Try, try saying something great happened on this part of the field who knows what it was. Something great happened over here on the court. Who can tell me what happened, right? Invite them into that space to be able to learn as leaders how to provide that positive feedback. Same thing if you see a mistake that be, needs to be corrected. Don't say anything. I promise you, maybe not four, five, and six, although you know you never know, but I promise you when you get to middle school, junior high school, high school, a majority of them know the mistake that was made. And it's really, really important for their development as leaders that they know how to positively, or excuse me, they know how to correctly give feedback to one another in a positive way and that they know how to receive it. So give them that opportunity to step into that space. Again, if they're not comfortable, if nobody's doing it, say, something happened on this part of the field, let's figure out how to correct it together and invite them into that space. This really, when I learned about this later in my coaching career, it really transformed how I coached. It really changed my perspective. It, my mindset was always very focused on developing my leadership abilities, which is absolutely important for a coach. But- Inherent in that also, as part of your development as a leader, is fostering the development of others. So I really encourage you to, to try this at some point, you know, in your next coming practices or seasons. The next leadership styles I'll talk about are very opposing leadership styles, and they're very focused on decision making. Democratic leadership versus autocratic leadership. Democratic leadership, very much how it sounds, right? You're taking a democratic approach to decision making. You know, you're listening to, considering, and valuing team members' opinions before making team-related decisions. What this does is, is it very quickly engenders a culture of mutual trust and respect and really can get a lot of buy-in very quickly from your athletes. You know, I know for me personally, in my professional life, if somebody asks my opinion, really cares about it, takes it into consideration when making a decision, I am more invested in that decision making its way to its intended or positive outcome. It's it's human nature, right? We have some stake. We have some buy-in. We want to do everything we can to see it through. You know, that is the really great part of democratic leadership. But like any leadership style, there are drawbacks. It's a slower, more deliberative approach to decision-making. And if you coach a team that doesn't really have a very strong developed leadership style or leadership presence, you have to be careful who you're taking input from, right? Because again, you're the coach. You're responsible for making team decisions and you're responsible for their outcomes. So as much as you may be a democratic leader and you may want input from your athletes, if they don't have very strong or developed sense or very strong or developed sense of leadership abilities themselves, be careful about what you're asking them to give input on. Because if you disregard their input, if you don't really take it into consideration because you realize later on you shouldn't have asked, that could be detrimental to the team culture. So just be careful as a democratic leader that you're, you're asking for input at the right times and that you're truly going to take it into consideration. On the other side of the coin is autocratic leadership. 
Don't be scared off by being an autocratic leader. Lots and lots of successful coaches are autocratic leaders. But the idea of autocratic leadership outside the context of sports can be a negative one. So I know there's an apprehension amongst coaches because I saw it in the research to identify themselves unless it's anonymous as an autocratic leader. And I understand that. But I'm here to tell you it's okay to be an autocratic leader, right? Lots of coaches are autocratic leader. And for a lot of coaches, it makes sense to be an autocratic leader. If you're coaching little kids, if you're coaching middle school, even I felt it at the college level when I had teams that were new or young and didn't have very strong developed leadership abilities, I trusted myself as a coach and I wanted to make the decisions, right? Again, if I'm responsible for team decisions, I'm responsible for their outcomes, I'm going to make the best decisions for the team that I believe in, that I believe are correct. And that may mean making unilateral decisions or being more autocratic, but that's totally fine. You know, now you're not going to get that same buy-in as a democratic leader because you're more unilaterally making decisions. You're not soliciting very much feedback, but you know what? If you're an autocratic leader and you make great decisions and it leads to team success, you're still going to end up at the same place. Okay. So you can still get that same buy-in, that same trust and respect by making great decisions. I also encourage you as an autocratic leader, particularly if you have a newer, or younger team, transparency can help. If you make unilateral decision after unilateral decision after unilateral decision, and your team can't really see those positive outcomes yet, I encourage you to be more transparent about why you're making those decisions so that you can keep them engaged and get some buy-in as opposed to just making the decisions and them having judge you based on a lack of outcome. So just be careful, read your team, check in with them and be willing to be transparent as an autocratic leader as the decisions that you're making because sometimes you can still get that same buy-in during the process if your kids or athletes know why you made the decision that you did. And then the last leadership style I'll talk about is transactional leadership. Transactional leadership is leadership style that, again, I think virtually all coaches practice at least some small element of. At its core is setting clear standards and expectations. If at the start of the year, you lay out your team rules and your team standards and expectations, that is in itself a transactional leadership behavior. If you are late to practice two times, you can't start the next game. That's a rule and it's transactional, all right? And that's the very, I think, very standard part of transactional leadership. It's one that a lot of coaches practice. The part that in previous generations was practiced much more frequently, but is not as common now, but I still think can be effective when practiced in a specific way, is the contingent rewards and punishment system. The idea that if you want your team to accomplish a short-term goal, you dangle an opportunity for a reward or you threaten a punishment. In my experience and in my research and in life and human nature, you are going to build much stronger relationships, much better trust and have much better outcomes if you give people the opportunity to gain a reward as motivation versus if you threaten them with a punishment. So focusing on the rewards aspect of this, I do think when used intermittently, if you make everything into a reward, or a reward, just like with other things in life, people get desensitized to it. It's not really a reward anymore. It's just the standard. So when used intermittently, I do believe that a reward system can be a strong motivating factor, particularly for accomplishing short-term goals, getting off of a plateau, getting over the hump. We're trying, trying, trying. We just need that little bit of extra. Sometimes putting the reward out there can help you get there. Be careful with transactional leadership because it's very inflexible and it's supposed to change. So if you say at your team meeting at the start of the year, my rule is if you're late to practice two times, you can't start the next game. Well, if your best player is late to practice for the second time before the big game, you can't start her. Otherwise, you will risk undermining your credibility as a leader. So if you're going to set standards, expectations, and team rules, which I think is a positive and correct thing to do at all levels of sports, make sure there are things you are comfortable with sticking to because they more than likely will be challenged. You will have to make a tough or unpopular decision, but make sure it's the one that's in favor of, of keeping those standards and expectations. Otherwise, again, you risk and probably will lose your credibility as a leader. So 
in the last part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about a question that I ask myself a lot and I get asked a lot, which is how do I know if my leadership style is working? So let's go back to the question and answer from the beginning. Let's go back to my experiment about how I can make intentional leadership choices to help my college athletes have a great experience. So when I went back at the end of the season and I critically reflect on those decisions that I made, I thought about my first decision. Number one, did I show up to practice as intended? Did I actually enact this behavior to the level that I had envisioned? And I did. I showed up. I was very diligent. I was there almost every time before everybody got there. I said, hello. I, you know, I, I shook everybody's hand. I asked them a question. I gave them a little individual consideration. When I look back on that season, those were the strongest, best relationships that I had with any team and with any individuals on that team. It just, it really helped me gain a lot of mutual trust and respect, build really strong relationships. I was visible. I was present. I was there for them. I cared about them as individuals. I made a huge extra effort. How sustainable that was, that's a different presentation. But for the purposes of me trying to figure out how I can build strong relationships with my athletes, this worked out as intended. Great. Check. Successful leader, right? I, I should have gone home then. My second intentional leadership choice was, again, wanting to provide feedback in a way that was more conducive to getting a, a better response. Um, I tried to make sure that I provided feedback as much as I could one-on-one. -on -one. And that was going okay. The problem was, is that, you know, at a college practice, you have to provide a lot of feedback. Constantly having my athletes come to the side and talk to me one-on-one -on -one took away one from me coaching the team. And two, it slowed things down. It broke up the flow. They're constantly coming to talk to me. It hurt their relationships with the other coaches on the team. Overall, it was not great. So when I looked back on this, I realized, one, why am I trying to fit a square peg into a round hole? Not every, I know not every athlete cares if I do this. Some of the team, they don't care if I give them feedback in front of their peers. It's all the same to them. So why am I taking the time to try to do something that doesn't actually meet their need? All right, so right off the bat, half the team, this isn't a need for them, so I don't need to do it. The second part of it was, with every little thing, do my kids actually care if I'm giving it to them in a group? I needed to do a little more dissection into what type of feedback, what tone, what presentation, what was it specifically that I had some of my athletes not responding well to? Those were the type of feedback or type of situations I needed to try to do one-on-one. -on -one. But not every time I needed you to move two steps to the left or jump six inches higher did I need to have them come over to the side of the court. So I needed to do a little more fleshing out of that specific leadership choice so I could really get into what the specific need was because I was only looking at the surface need. I wasn't really delving into it enough to see if my intentional leadership choice was actually impacting what the core issue was. And then intentional leadership choice number three, which I thought was a no brainer, I thought would be the best leadership decision I ever made was that we were gonna end every practice with a game. I, was, I really thought I had struck gold with this one. Like everybody wants to end on a high note. You know, everybody wants to have fun. And we started out and we played a game at the end of the first few practices and it was amazing. They loved it. You know, we're, we're all high-fiving. Everybody's happy. They're running back to the locker room. Everybody's in a good mood. It really ended practice on a high note. No matter how, you know, much of a struggle practice was to that point, we ended on a positive note. And I thought I had struck gold with this idea, right? This is what people are missing. They, they're forgetting the fun. We go a few more practices and a few more practices. And I start to realize, all right, the games are becoming disorganized. I'm losing guys' attention. They're not really into it. And then as we got into the second half of the season, I started to see that some of my players did not even want to play. Like they were turned off by the game. They were becoming kind of dejected. So I, I didn't want this to like carry on to the end of the year to dissect what was happening with this leadership choice. So I started talking to them. And, you know, the initial feedback I got was, well, coach, it was fun at the beginning, but when we do it every time, it's not really that much reward. It kind of lost that fun component, right? It's like, okay, that's good feedback. You're right. I, I should have made it a little more intermittent, a little more of a reward, a little more of a, actually like a fun thing. But then for the athletes who were kind of becoming discouraged or dejected, I, I didn't really understand. So I started talking to them and they said, coach Matt, we play the same type of games every time. 
we primarily play shooting games. I'm not a good shooter. I always lose very quickly. And then I watch everybody else have fun. And I thought to myself, that's, I wish I had known that. Like, that's a great point. So we should do games that highlight different skills. We should do different team games so that it doesn't matter so much focus on the individual. Again, I hadn't really thought through what some of those unintended consequences might be, which is okay. You're not always going to think about those as a leader. But in retrospect, I had taken too much time to figure out why this wasn't working the way that it was. So sometimes as a leader, you have to kind of interject yourself a quarter of the way, halfway, and be prepared to change course or make adjustments on a leadership choice that you made and not just kind of continue to watch it go down, down, down. So as a leader, if you aren't getting the outcomes that you wanted, I made three leadership decisions that were reflective of who I am as a leader. And I thought they were all great decisions and to varying degrees, they worked or didn't work. That doesn't mean I was a failure, okay? There's no such thing as a perfect leader and you're not always gonna practice the best leadership style and behaviors. You know, you are, that does not mean you are failing. All of those intentional leadership choices could have ended the way the game did. I would not have been a failure as a leader. I shouldn't have viewed myself as a failure. Leadership is a journey. It's filled with ups and downs, relative successes and failures, but the defining part of your leadership journey is not, I succeeded once, I kind of succeeded another time and I failed. That's not the point. That's not how you should judge yourself. Judge yourself based on the fact that you are trying to be a better leader and that you care enough about your athletes and team to keep improving yourself and your leadership practice. And then to end, I will just run through a few um, tips that I use that I encourage coaches to use to improve your leadership practice and abilities over time. One is, like we just talked about, be willing to critically reflect on your intentional leadership choices and how they directly impacted your team's ability to accomplish goals. You know That can be difficult, but be honest with yourself, reflect on it. And again, if it didn't work, you are not a failure. It's just an opportunity for you to adjust that, leader, that intentional leadership choice and try again. Be honest with yourself during challenging times and take ownership of your leadership decisions. You are the coach. You are making decisions. They are yours. If they don't work, that there is a large element of that on you and you need to reflect on that, be honest and figure it out. Continuously gain leadership knowledge and tools that you can apply to your leadership practice. Keep learning, keep going to presentations, keep reading books, keep analyzing your leadership decisions, but don't be too hard on yourself. You know That's how you learn and grow as a leader. Constantly work to understand the evolving needs of your athletes. Kids today, their needs are changing every season, month, week, day, hour, within practice. There's just, they're getting, they're getting it from so many different directions. There's so many things that they're exposed to. There's so much information they're exposed to. Be understanding and empathetic of that. Work to understand their needs. Work to understand that there are things outside of the team dynamic that are affecting their performance, that are affecting their mood. Again, be willing to ask those questions, be work to constantly build those relationships based on trust and respect so that they'll tell you what's going on off the court, field, pool, whatever it is, so that you could better meet their needs as a coach and a leader. Be open to new ideas about leadership practice. I hope that you have learned some leadership ideas, you've gained some leadership tools that you're going to be brave enough to go out and try in your leadership practice with your teams. And then seek out and listen to feedback on your leadership practice from people that you trust. We all have leadership blind spots, whether it's mentors, friends, partners, other coaches, whomever it is, people who know you and your personal values and beliefs, be willing to ask them for their honest assessment of your leadership practice, particularly in areas where you feel like you don't have the clearest or most honest picture of what was going on or what happened. So that is my presentation. Thank you so much to the library for having me. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. If after this, you have questions, find me on social media, email me. I am always happy to answer questions about your leadership practice, helpful in any way I can. If you have leadership scenarios um, that come up during the course of the season or the off season that you're thinking through, feel free to reach out and let me know. I hope that you will check out my book and that you'll learn a lot more about leadership practice and um, be able to continue to learn and grow as a leader. And thank you so much again to the library for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for taking the time to um, to share these insights with us. This is really um, 
really interesting for me. And um, I had a couple of questions, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, so when you were talking about the different types of leadership styles, specifically the democratic and the auto autocratic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you kind of can blend them, right? Like you, you don't want to say like, I'm this one. You, you may want to shift that back and forth during a season or throughout the years. Is that correct or, or no? Yeah, I, you know, absolutely. I mean, there are times where, I, you know, I was a more democratic leader. I, I always wanted to give my kids the opportunity to give me feedback. Right. But, you know, even the most democratic leader has to make snap decisions, quick decisions. You can't always get feedback. Or I didn't, I didn't always feel like my athletes were ready to provide me with that feedback. And I had to be more autocratic. So to me, the most important thing is just understanding where the decision is coming from. You know, having that foundational leadership knowledge to know, okay, I'm making, I'm acting more autocratic. This is the potential fallout from it. Maybe my athletes are used to being more democratic. So they might question the decision because I didn't ask for their feedback. Maybe I'm going to get some resistance because I don't have that same buy-in. You know, if I'm being more democratic, maybe they aren't super comfortable giving me their feedback yet. And I've got to kind of, you know, help bring it out of them. So it's the most important thing, especially when you're blending those leadership styles and, and that's going to happen is just knowing that, you know, this is the leadership style I'm practicing and this is some of the potential, you know, unintended consequences. The other important part of that is it, it be careful about blending them at the same time because that can become kind of confusing, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're asking, okay, provide me with your feedback on this decision and then you just act unilaterally, that could that could be detrimental to your team culture. You could lose that buy-in or lose some of that trust because okay, coach is asking for my opinion, but does coach really care? You know, sometimes you you ask for their opinion, you really care and you make a completely different decision. That's okay, but just be conscious of that because in that scenario, maybe you want to be more transparent about why you didn't, it doesn't feel like you took their, um, you know, their opinions into consideration more. So again, just some of those nuances when you're blending them, just to be kind of leery of as a coach and a leader, I think are really important. Right. Thank you. That's really interesting. And I also really appreciate, um, I mean, you're kind of talking about reflecting on why, you know, did this work? How did this work? And then kind of tweaking it a little bit. Um, that's, that's really valuable um, information. It kind of reminded me, like, if I read a book, I read a book and I, and I stop and think about it, what did it, what did I get from it? And that can help give it more meaning. And I kind of, you know, listening to your sharing your experiences on coaching and your, your uh, book um, kind of got that too. Like, it's kind of important to step back and, and, reflect a little bit about what's going on with your team, what's going on with your decision-making and, and how you can maybe adjust it a little bit. Is that, is that fair? Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's so hard when things are happening or in the moment to reflect on, um, was this actually what I wanted it to be? Was this actually successful? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's only when we get a little time away that we're able to see, you know, was this truly successful in the way that I wanted it to be? You know, when I look back on my coaching career and, you know, coaches put a lot of emphasis on winning and losing. And that that's right. that's an easy way to judge success or failure in some respects because there's that, you know, there's that clear outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look back on my coaching career, um, whether it's with winning or losing or um, athletes staying with our program or giving us positive feedback that they had a good experience, you know, at the time, it didn't always feel that way. Um, but you never really know until the end, until you've, you've had the opportunity to process it. And until those that you're leading have had the opportunity to process right. it, you know, some of the athletes that I felt I was the hardest on or seemingly had the most contentious relationship during a season, we had the strongest bond afterward. Um, but I, at the time I just, I would worry that we didn't have a good relationship that, they, you know, they didn't like me that, um, you know, I wasn't helping them. So you, you kind of got to let it play out. You have to trust your instincts, but also be open to some of those signs as things are going on that you may need to adjust course during. Try not to overreact as best as possible. I always say try for incremental changes so that you don't completely kind of over adjust and go too far the other direction, or you overreact to what you think are some signs, but always be willing to kind of tweak and adjust as you go 
to help the relationship or motivation or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Right. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And um, a lot of this, I felt like, you know, could be applied to non-coaching uh, situations as well, whether it be parenting or coworkers. So I really, I got a lot more out of this than I expected. So thank you. This was really, really, really interesting. And I very much appreciate it. I know we all do. So again, thank you, Dr. Raybard. And um, we look forward to hearing from you again uh, in the future. I'm going to end the recording now.